Good evening. I hope you saw last month's partial eclipse of the sun. This picture was taken by Douglas Arnold, and almost half the sun was obscured there. That will be the last solar eclipse we will see from Britain for some time, and we all look forward now to the 11th of August, 1999, when there will be a total eclipse as seen from Cornwall. But meanwhile, I want to turn to the red planet Mars. Now, Mars is now a morning object. It's in the constellation of Leo the Lion, not very far away from the bright star Regulus, and roughly the same brilliancy. It's moved since Chris Doherty took that picture, but it's still in Leo. Telescopically, Mars shows a white polar cap, which looks like and is ice, and red desert areas, and those dark regions, once thought, wrongly, to be old seabeds filled with vegetation. We now know they're simply areas where the red, dusty stuff has been scoured away by winds in the thin Martian atmosphere. And the atmosphere of Mars really is thin and made up chiefly of carbon dioxide. And Mars is a small world, only just over 4,000 miles in diameter, very much smaller than the Earth. It's also further away from the Sun than we are, on average just over 141 million miles, and it has a year of 687 Earth days, which is 668 Mars days, because Mars spins round rather more slowly than we do, and a Martian day is only 24 and a half hours long. Now, apart from Earth, Mars has always been regarded as the planet in the Sun's family most likely to harbour life. And um, even in our own century, some astronomers believe that there might be intelligent life there. One of these was Percival Lowell, an American, who built an observatory of Flagstaff in Arizona and equipped it with a very fine 24-inch refracting telescope, which I know very well, let me say. And Lowell observed Mars and made drawings like this. And those lines there he called canals, and he was sure they were artificial waterways built by the Martians in a planet-wide irrigation system. And had those drawings been accurate, then Mars would have been inhabited. But we now know they're not the canals don't exist, they were simply tricks of the eye. And in fact, you can't have open water upon Mars now, because the atmosphere is too thin. But there are old stream beds, and they've been imaged by various space probes, but they don't correspond with Lowell's canals. So, one thing I quite something about, there are no Martians, and never have been. But nevertheless, Mars is a fascinating world, and at the moment, various probes are on their way there. And now, I'm delighted to welcome back once again, Dr. Peter Cannibal. Peter, various probes are either on their way to Mars or are about to be launched. Well, yes, Patrick, it's an exciting time. It's, uh, it's about 20 years since the last spacecraft, Viking, landed on Mars, and now we're in the fortunate position of in less than a month, we're going to have three new spacecraft on their way to Mars. The first of these is Mars Global Surveyor, and that was launched successfully on November the 7th. And we have a timeline here. You'll see uh, on the left, top, Global Surveyor, the blue region is the time that it takes for it to reach Mars. It's about 10 months. And when it re reaches Mars, it will operate for quite a long period. And this is largely a mapping probe. The second one to be launched is a Russian probe called Mars 96. That goes off on November the 16th, all being well. It'll arrive in July 97, and that will be a much more complex thing, which will operate till the end of 99. The third probe, another American one, is called Mars Pathfinder. A very interesting one goes off, or we hope, on December the 2nd. Um, that will get to Mars uh, in the summer of 97. A uh, rather complex thing, operate for about a year and a half. And all of this is part of a continuing mission, uh, or series of missions, a series of Russian missions going off in 98, as you'll see there, operating for a period, Mars 01, and so on. And also, there are other probes we can't show on the diagram, because every 26 months, uh, the US is hoping to send a probe to Mars until the year 2005. So a great deal is going on. And I think, Peter, it'll help if we start with an update upon what we really know about Mars. Well, we now know an awful lot. Um, the first basic division of the planet, um, in, in the same way as the Earth has oceans and continents, is that Mars has low-lying and upland regions. And in this slightly strange sinusoidal map, the northern one-third of Mars is shown in blue, and that is because it's lower than the mean datum. It's about a kilometre lower than Mars's mean radius. The southern two-thirds, shown here in colours of white and red and so on, is above datum. It's about two kilometres above the mean radius. And you'll see towards the bottom right of that map a large impact basin called Hellas and a large high region to the left, which is known as the Tharsis Bulge, which is an area of volcanism. So Mars has two 
distinct hemispheres. And interestingly, uh, this shows up very, very clearly. The line between the two hemispheres is called the line of dichotomy. And in this Viking image, you can see it very clearly. It runs from west to east across this image. And in the bottom, you can see the, the cratered surface very, very clearly. To the north of that line, there are far fewer craters and much smoother appearances to be found. And we can put this on a map of Mars very clearly, uh, showing the distribution of craters. And here, you see the southern uh, hemisphere of Mars, the western one on the left, the eastern one on the right. You can see there's a far greater incidence of craters in the south of Mars and a far smaller incidence in the north. And if we were to superimpose the zero contour on that map, you would see at least for the eastern hemisphere, the zero contour followed the line of what we call dichotomy. But turn to the western hemisphere and you'll see there's a discrepancy. And there is a large area of high ground without a great incidence of craters. This is the volcanic area of Tharsis and it has been very important in Martian history. So we have a picture of how things have moved on Mars. We actually have a Martian timescale now in the same way as we have a timescale for the Earth. And the earliest period of Martian history is known as the Noachian, named after the Noachis area of the Southern Hemisphere. And most geological activity appears, to, or the oldest geological activity, appears to have started 4.4 giga eons ago. That's 4,400 million years ago. The early Noachian was followed by the late Noachian, when there was a lot of cratering going on, went, al went on until about 3.8 giga eons ago followed by a period known as the Hesperian, and that in turn followed at about 3,500 million years ago by the beginning of the Amazonian period, it carried on to about 2.3 giga eons, followed to the middle Amazonian, and then of course, as one might expect, up into the late Amazonian. The main period of cratering uh, stopped in Hesperian. What we now know also is that there were periods of the cutting of valleys, the movement of water and complex valley networks were cut into the ancient cratered highlands between the early and late Noachian. That period of geological activity was then followed by a period of huge floods, and this appears to have continued right up into the uh, early Amazonian, about 2,400 million years ago. So we have a very good picture of the sequence of events, which we certainly didn't have, say, 10 or 20 years ago. If we were to look at some of the valley features which we've mapped, they're very interesting. This is a Viking picture. Um, you can see a large impact crater on the left there, that's about 80 kilometers across, showing one of the small valley networks that was cut in the uh, Noachian period. The outflow channels were much bigger affairs. This is Juventus Casmar. It's about 200 kilometers from north to south and several thousand kilometers long. And that shifted, in Hesperian times, enormous quantities of water. Uh, and it just looks like a huge flood channel, doesn't it? It does indeed. But you say we can't have any open water upon Mars now because the atmospheric pressure is too low. Therefore, Peter, where has all the water gone? This is a very good question. This is something we couldn't answer uh, before Viking landed on Mars. But one of the things that Viking did show us quite clearly, particularly at the Viking Lander 2 site, uh, was that there is frost on the surface. And you see here a series of old basalt boulders on the Utopian plains. And in the shadow, on the shadowed side of these boulders, you see clear evidence that the tenuous Martian atmosphere, tenuous though it may be, does contain gas which can sublimate on the surface and also freeze. And you see the Martian frost there. Uh, Mars also locks up volatiles in its polar caps. And we see a lovely Hubble Space Telescope view here of the Martian polar caps. And you indeed can see on the edge of that cap near the dark border a beautiful uh, picture of a dust storm. Yes, indeed. Uh, and indeed, the, if you look at the two sets of images, there are two taken here uh, a, a, about a month apart. You can see that the shape of the dust storm between the top and bottom image has changed as the tenuous atmosphere, still able to raise quite strong winds, has moved the dust around. Uh, Viking also imaged the Martian clouds, showing that there is a tenuous atmosphere. We do have volatiles still there. Uh, these clouds are very thin, cirrus-like clouds. You see them here, the Martian limb. So there is volatile material there. Where has it gone? The answer is uh, some of it has gone in the polar caps, as you see in this Hubble picture. Uh, and indeed, there are some very light, tenuous clouds seen in that picture too. But much of it appears to have gone into the interior of Mars. 
Now, when the ancient crater terrain was battered by meteorites, it became very, very fractured, and we believe that fluids percolated down into the brecciated crust, and as the Martian climate got harsher and harsher, that froze to form ice in what we call the mega regolith. And interestingly, the time at which this happened um, uh, was quickly followed by a huge period of volcanism in the Tharsis region, and it could be that volcanism which melted that ice. It would probably look something like uh, what is now happening in Iceland at this particular time, so it's a very timely occurrence. It certainly is indeed. Well, we're learning more all the time, aren't we? Well, we certainly are. And one of the, the most interesting things is that the mapping that has been done as part of the Mars Surface and Atmosphere Through Time program is to realize that the water actually collected in lakes. Now, we have here a rather nice map of Mars, uh, and you can see to the left the four red dots of the Tharsis volcanoes sitting on a huge bulge in the crust. And running east from there is a, a very prominent canyon system known as Valles Marineris, named after the Mariner 9 Pro, which first discovered it. And this canyon system runs for several thousand kilometers across the equator. It's a fault-guided structure. It's not a river but its eastern end from our mapping appears to have subsided, forming an area we know as chaotic terrain. It's where the Martian crust has collapsed, and we believe its collapse was associated with the melting of the ice locked up in the Martian regolith over 3,000 million years ago, and the outflow channels were sourced by the chaos and took water uh, right at the surface into the Martian northern plains. The Areas of chaos are, are very dramatic on the Viking pictures. You see one here at the eastern end of the Valles Marineris, and you can just get the impression that that crust was held together by ice, yes. the ice was melted, and the, that whole region simply collapsed. And the water was then taken by these enormous channel systems into the northern plains. The outflow channels are vast. Um, this black and white mosaic made from a whole series of images, it's a, it's a sort of Martian map if you like, uh, it, it flows from west to east down slope and you can see at its western end the channel is quite narrow, they have tributaries to the east, uh, perhaps a thousand kilometres further down slope the channel broadens and we have these huge scoured channel mouths where the uh, water actually entered what we think were standing lakes. And, of course, standing lakes raises the possibility that perhaps if there's water there in large quantity, life may have once developed. I wonder. Well, we've got various probes going there now. What are these new probes going to look for, particularly? Well, the probes are actually going to be look, or are eventually aiming, to find places where we might successfully seek traces of life in the Martian rocks. Now, the obvious place we could do this would be at the mouth of a Martian canyon. Um, and these Martian canyons debouch into lakes. Uh, the lakes are shown on this map quite clearly in the Northern Hemisphere. If we could find a site somewhere near the mouth of one of these river systems where it entered what we believe was a lake, then this would be the place that we need to send a probe. So we actually have three missions going to Mars in the near future, and they all have very different aims. The the first of these is called Mars Global Surveyor, and as we said earlier, this went up very successfully on November the 7th. Now, this is going to carry a whole series of experiments. Um, you see it here in the picture being packed up, or just prior to being packed up, to be put in its nose cone and put on top of the uh, rocket that launched it last week. Um, it's carrying most of the experiments that went on the ill-fated Mars Observer. All but two are going. It's going to arrive on September the 11th. It's only an orbiting probe and it's going to do some more mapping for us. Yes. And there's a whole series of these going to go towards Mars over the next eight years. Yes. The second one to be launched, uh, hopefully within about a week, is the Russian Mars 96. And we have a picture here of the, of the Russian probe as it was standing in, in the laboratory prior to being launched. This is a much more complicated thing. It's actually going to get to Mars before Global Surveyor, strangely. Um, but this is going to be launched, and when it gets into orbit around Mars, it's going to release a couple of small probes, one of which contains two penetrators, sort of cylinders, which are going to, under the influence of gravity, dive into the Martian rocks, giving us our first ideas of the strength and the physical properties of these rocks. And, of course, the instruments are also going to measure the magnetic field and so on. Perhaps the 
most interesting to my mind is the third of these called <laughs> Mars Pathfinder. Um, now, Mars Pathfinder should arrive at Mars in July 97. It's been launched, as I say, on December 2nd of this year. Take about nine months to get there. And this is an amazing thing. Um, it's, you can see a picture here of the strange little rover called Sojourner. It's a thing about the size of a, of a large video player with six wheels, <laughs> and it's able to climb over quite large rocks. And it's going to be sent, obviously, aboard the, the main probe, but when the main probe gets, or the main rocket gets into the Martian atmosphere, into orbit, it's eventually, once it's stabilised, going to release the bus that descends by parachute to the Martian surface. And for the first time, this strange object, this um, micro rover in its uh, command module, is going to be encased in large inflated sort of balloon-like objects, rather like a sort of huge Michelin person. It's going to hit the surface, be cushioned by this collection of balloons, you see it doing here, bounce across the surface until it comes to rest. The balloons, hopefully if this all works, are going to deflate, revealing this beautiful thing sitting on the Martian surface. The wings, the solar panels, the command probe are going to open, ramps will then be deployed and the little rover, hopefully, Sojourner, is going to go down onto the Martian surface. A number of commands are going to be issued to it and one of the things we hope it's going to do is force itself up against Martian rocks in the Aries Vallis and actually analyse them with a, with a rather sophisticated chemical and analytical instrument. And the place that's been chosen for this thing to land is an area known as Iris Valis. You can see it on this rather nice uh, Viking mosaic. It's one of those huge river systems, and it's going to land right at the mouth of that river system. And the reason for that is that it's what we would call a good grab bag site, because if you have a very large river system, let's say like the Earth's Amazon, if you wanted to find the widest variety of rock types you could on the planet, you'd go to where a big river brings stuff down to a, a lake or the sea. And that's the place where it's going. And of course, you get any life on Mars, it may be in an area like that. As you know, the Viking probe landed upon Mars in 1976, scooped up material, analyzed it, and sent back the results, and showed no definite signs of life. But now, Peter, there are new suggestions, are there not? There are indeed, and these come from ancient Martian meteorites, which have fallen in Antarctica. And this is the one that's hit the news. Um, it's 4,500 million years old, and when it was sitting on the surface of Mars as a solid rock, it became very severely cracked about 4,000 million years ago. And fluids introduced into the cracks carbonate globules, and associated with these carbonate globules were metalliferous grains and, on the surface of the globules, worm-like growth that looked like very tiny versions of terrestrial microbacteria. And it's this evidence which is getting the press at the present time. Well, it's all fascinating. I think you'll agree, Peter. It is an interesting possibility, but at the moment, certainly no more. And I think we'll find out for certain only when we send sample and return probes to Mars, collect Mars material, and analyze it in our laboratories. And that should become possible within the next few years. And of course, in the next century, we are certain to have bases upon the Martian surface. And then we'll know for certain. But the one thing I'm quite sure, there never have been any Martians. Peter, thank you very much. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, dial up our Sky at Night information line, 0891 8030. And when I come back next month, we are staying inside the solar system, but I'll be joined by Professor Gary Hunt, and we'll be talking about the latest results from the Galileo probe, now orbiting the giant planet Jupiter. So until then, good night. <laughs>